Little Red Riding Hood went out one day to visit Grandma, who lived far away. But to her surprise, when she got there, she saw her grandma gasping for air. Red was a doctor, and Granny smoked lots. Was it COPD? Red connected the dots. So Red gave oxygen, nebulizers, and took an ABG, and called for help when she saw a PCO2 of 12.3. Should I stop the oxygen? I simply don't know. She is hypoxic, but what if the breathing gets slow? Her colleague Jenny said, first always treat hypoxia. Treat hypercapnia later, as they say in uh, Moldavia? Let's talk about oxygen-induced hypercapnia and its explanations. It begins in the 1770s and in two different nations. A new element was discovered by Sheila and Priestley. They found oxygen and oh, how it made candles burn fiercely. In 1783, a patient was treated with oxygen. What a joy! But this is a cautionary tale. Oxygen is not a toy. In 1949, we can read about hypercapnic coma in COPD. The explanation then for hypercapnia was hypoxic drive solely. Chronic hypercapnia makes respiration respond to hypoxia rather than high PCO2. Extra oxygen inhibits the respiratory drive, which was believed to cause this issue. But as for all simple truths, and this is not new, this turned out to be neither simple nor true. In the 1960s, researchers looked into this topic anew. Decreased respiratory rate couldn't explain the whole rise in PCO2. A study on hypercapnia clarified the confusion. It was due to a mismatch of ventilation and perfusion. Emphysematous alveoli ventilate poorly. That's not strange. And hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction redirects blood to optimize net pulmonary exchange. Giving extra oxygen can at times disable this useful HPV, as more blood flows past alveoli that are quite poorly. This means less blood in alveoli that can ventilate out the CO2, which can cause hypercapnia, coma, and patients turning blue. But my dear little Red Riding Hood, as you soon will see, there is a third mechanism that also explains this mystery. Other researchers in the 1960s said the previous mechanisms were incorrect and suggested that the hypercapnia was caused by the Haldane effect. The effect describes how hemoglobin carrying CO2 can shift. When oxygen binds hemoglobin, previously bound CO2 is set adrift. It's unclear how important each mechanism is, which is exciting. Different studies on different patients have had incongruent findings. Heterogeneous observational studies abound, so there might still be mechanisms we haven't found. A learning from looking at the medical puzzles that have been solved is that it's tricky to figure out physiology when many factors are involved. Another insight is that these mechanisms occur in patients without COPD. That's why retention can occur in patients that are hypoventilated chronically. Red Riding Hood, this is all important. I hope you agree. So here's a summary. Memorize this and listen closely. First, three mechanisms cause oxygen-induced hypercapnia, as far as we know. Hypoxic drive, HPV, and the Haldane effect all reduce CO2 outflow. Second, the oxygen-induced hypercapnia doesn't require COPD. Neuromuscular diseases and other lung diseases can also cause this malady. Finally, most importantly, always give oxygen to a hypoxic patient. These are the critical words. Hypoxia kills fastest. You might cause hypercapnia, but you can sort that out afterwards. Suddenly, Red Riding Hood realized the conclusion she had drawn. It's perilous to believe we fully understand complex physiological phenomenon. It's best to deeply study what we know today, while knowing these explanations might soon become passé. So Granny and Red shared some cookies and teas, debating antibiotics' role in exacerbations of COPD. When they found the Cochrane Review, they broke out in laughter. In short, they kept their curiosity alive and lived happily ever after.